welcome back to the lecture series on bioenergy. So, we are in the module 2 and we have finished first two lectures where we talked about the overall uh, scheme of processes which happens in photosynthesis. We described the light reaction and the dark reaction and uh, we talked about photosystem 1, photosystem 2 and the electron transport and the proton gradient which is created across the thylakoid membrane. So, at this stage all my viewers and listeners have an overall idea of what are the processes which are happening in photosynthesis. Now, in next two classes what we will do, so today we will be starting our eighth lecture. Now, next two or two three classes our idea will be to explore each one of those processes in greater detail, so that what all the next generation of uh, technologies which are evolving by getting inspiration from them can be clear to all of you. So, let us get back to the slide, but today we are into the lecture 8, so essentially in the module 2. And this is basically the third lecture of module 2, 3 by 2, that is why I did it like this. Okay. So, now if you remember the first, very first reaction what we have dealt with was CO2 plus H2O making CH2O plus oxygen as the byproduct. Now, fairly early in the 18th century, this reaction was discovered, but this, this reaction was not discovered in one shot. There are few landmark discoveries or you can say landmark events, which led to the discovery of the photosynthesis. So, we will just in couple of minutes, we will kind of highlight them that will give you an idea of the timeline when this discoveries need happen. Okay. Now, add one more component to this was the role of light, which is a light driven reaction. So, if we look at it, it was the evolving of oxygen, this part, this was by Joseph Presley, just putting the name, you can cross check, you can go online and you can figure it out. And around 1780. The next uh, major discovery which happens was the role of light, which was described by a Dutch scientist, his name was Jan Ingenhaus. Okay. So, who discovered the role of light? The third one was Jules Senebier. So, his discovery was with this carbon dioxide, what he essentially says, let me just put the name, Jules Senebier showed that CO2 is taken up in photosynthesis. I am just putting P S as photosynthesis, not putting the whole name. Then came the role of water out here, what do you see, I am just putting a different color code for your understanding. Role of water was basically shown by a guy called Theodore de Saussure. What he said that he demonstrated that uh, some of the weights of the organic matter produced by plant and of the oxygen evolved is much more than the weight of CO2 consumed. And based on the law of conservation of mass by Lavishore, he predicted that this is nothing but the water. Okay. And all these, so you see Joseph Presley here, this is around 1780, very similar. Jan Jagenhaus worked at the same time. Joe Senebier 
just soon after that and the Theodore de Saussure who talked about the role of water and the final contribution was made by Julius Robert Meyer. Julius Robert Meyer. So, what Meyer says was the plant take in one form of power that is light and produce another form of power called chemical molecules. So, essentially <coughs> it was completely summarized by Robert Meyer who said that it is a light energy is converted into a chemical energy and if you see it very clearly this is what is happening out here. This is the chemical molecule which is generated and in other words this is also a process natural process of carbon sequestration or carbon capturing because in the environment there are a lot of carbon dioxide. So, what you are essentially doing you are capturing the carbon dioxide or the carbon molecules and converting them into big carbohydrate molecule. In other word you can call this whole process as one second let me ok. So, this whole process could fall under carbon capturing or carbon sequestration, which is one of the very emerging challenging field currently that how we can sequester lot of this carbon dioxide in the form of uh, air pollutant which are present there. But this brings us to a very different uh, perspective to this whole thing. If there is a way one can emulate the photosynthetic apparatus, then essentially one can think of making food in an artificial chamber. Think of it, you have carbon dioxide is in abundance, you have water in abundance in the sea or the oceans and what you need and you have light in abundance. All your three commodities are in abundance. Now, if you can push them in one apparatus which will make carbohydrate as the way a chloroplast does, then what we are talking about is that you do not need to grow food in the fields, you actually can grow food in a small chamber. So, these are the kind of dream what mankind is seeing. In other words, you can actually form biomass if you know what really photosynthesis is doing. So, <clears throat> think of it, why I am putting thrust on this whole area is that the whole biomass formation is directly related to the photosynthetic output which is happening on the floor of earth as long as the solar energy is available to us. That is why now what we will do first from this point on our next journey will take us talking about the architecture of the organelle which is chloroplast. We will talk about the structure of the chloroplast. Our next slide we will move on to the structure of chloroplast. Structure of ok. Before I draw the structure try to visualize <coughs> Those of you have seen uh, Food Corporation of India's go downs or something, you must have seen that uh, there are gunny bags filled with grains, they are stacked over one another like this. At some point or other, all of you have seen this, if not in real life or at least in a picture you have seen it, ok. They are stacked over one another and there is a closed room inside which these grains are being kept. Exactly visualize a similar structure. Chloroplast is a double membrane structure. Before I draw this, try to visualize in your brain. It is a double membrane structure in which you will see stacking of those something like a gunny bags all over and there are connectors between them. So, now let me draw it what I was trying to tell you it will be something like this. So, the structure is this is the outer layer something like this a structure whose dimension is around 2 to 3 micron 
and on it you will see something like this. These are those gunny bags which are present here. This is the connectors like this. So, now that was what I was telling you, try to imagine where the grains are kept in gunny bags and these are those gunny bags that will kind of help you to visualize how the structure really looks like. Like this. Now, if we label these structures, let us uh, put the labeling to them. So, this is the, one second, this is the inner membrane, I am putting the inner membrane then the yellow shading what I am doing. This is the outer membrane. So, two envelopes inner membrane and the outer membrane. Then you have something, these structures are called thylakoid membranes. So, if you see the cross section of the thylakoid membrane, so you must have seen a pillow. So, imagine you have the cover of the pillow cover and you remove the cotton from it or any kind of cushioning agent. So, it is something like this. So, if I had to now coming back to the slide, if you see this structure very carefully, this structure will be something like, so there is a hollow part out here, this part is hollow. Okay? So, thylakoid membrane is kind of a inflated, it is kind of uh, you can say it is um, saucer like inflated structure, there are saucers like this and underneath it is hollow. So, and they have a different function that is why and all these structures are asymmetric. In other words, if you look at the outer periphery, so that is why I am putting different colors. So, if this part and this part, the inner and the outer, they have a different property. In property in the sense, their molecular arrangements of the different kind of proteins which are present there is entirely different. So, most of the biological membrane what we know of till this day are asymmetric in nature. And this asymmetry helps most of them to achieve some very unique functions. Okay. So, now coming back to the slides out here. So, there are few other things what we have to mark here. So, we talked about the thylakoid membrane and this is space in between what you see is called thylakoid space. Okay. Then uh, these kind of connectors are called stroma or lamellae. And then there is a space in between these two, which is called intermembrane space. Okay. And uh, this empty space, what you see, is called stroma. So, overall, this is the whole architecture of the chloroplast where these reactions are taking place. And if you guys remember, so where this photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 is located, now I will just let me point out in. So, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 is kind of suppose this is the inner membrane like this, they are connecting like this. So, now this is where the photosystem 1, photosystem 2, water splitting cluster, all these things are decorated around. So, you, what you see essentially is that, so this is where all the PS 1, 2, 
water splitting and all these things are located. Okay. So, if you see it is essentially a energy transforming membrane where the light energy is falling and the electrons are ejected and all the phenomena what we have talked in the last two classes is all happening at that site. Okay. So, this is and, and, and of course, if you look at the dimension, so we are talking about a dimension of around you know 5, 4 to 5 micron at the max or maybe less. And within that 4 to 5 micron, much, much smaller are these uh, smaller units where these kind of reactions are taking place. So, that is what I was telling you that if one can emulate even 10 percent of this kind of structures and make energy harvesting, then pretty much all our global energy problem will be solved. This is the kind of challenge where mankind is heading. Could we emulate a chloroplast? or could we emulate a uh, thylakoid membrane? Is it really possible? Maybe someday, somewhere. Okay. So, this is the overall architecture which what I want you guys to you know kind of you know keep in mind and uh, if you see wanted to know the composition of it, the composition is something like this. They nearly have equal amount of lipids and proteins, okay. almost equal amount of equal amounts of lipids and proteins and most of the lipids and the total lipids if you look at it. So, there are galactolipids, you have sulfolipids and you have phospholipids. These are the different kind of lipids which are present there. So, this is overall and of course, I have already mentioned you that one second. This structure also has its own genetic material. I have already mentioned and that is one of the reason why people say that this at some point in evolution was an stand alone organelle which for some x y z reason parasitized another animal and today what we see is the plant evolved because of that. Okay. So, coming back, so the next thing what we will be dealing with is once we are done with it. So, this is what you have talked about. Now, we will talk about the structure of the chlorophyll. So, so, the chlorophyll molecules how they look like. So, I told you that there are similarities between chlor chlorophyll and hemoglobin. I told you that if you remove the iron from the center of the porphyrin ring or then it becomes yellow because the whole porphyrin is yellow. Similarly, if you remove the magnesium which makes the chlorophyll then it remains as yellow. But the very moment you put magnesium it attains the green color, the very moment you put iron it attains the red color. Okay. So, now let us see the structure of the chlorophyll, the light trapping pigment structure of chlorophyll. So, the structure of chlorophyll is something like this, you have a coordination out here, you have the magnesium sitting out here like this and uh, this is the porphyrin structure. It is a complex structure, but just follow it, it will you will see a lot of symmetrical features in the structure. Okay. And, Similarly, you have okay. okay. ok. 
okay. And uh, in this corner you will see a CH and a methyl group present here, the another methyl group present here and there is something called an R, I am just putting it R here, that R essentially stands for one second, that, that R essentially stand for two situation, if it is one second, if it is CH3, then it is, so there are two kind of chlorophyll, then it is chlorophyll A and if it is CHO, then it is chlorophyll B. Okay, so, these are the two chlorophyll, generally it is represented by a small letter, so just correct that, chlorophyll B, out here another methyl group present here, at this point you have complex structure out here, where you see carbon and CH3 and out here you have an oxygen attached to it and on the other side okay so of the plane you have a methyl group hydrogen out here another hydrogen and out here this is where the second level of modification comes. And there is something called an R. This R is again very important for you guys to keep tap. And I will talk about the R just in few minutes. And uh, there is one small, okay, this, this bond is wrongly placed here actually, this should happen here. So now, <clears throat> you see this complex structure and I have not explained you about R, what that R stands for. Now what I will do, just follow up this picture and let us put what that R means in the next slide. So that R is equal to CH2, CH, another CH3, CH2, 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 CH, then another CH3, CH2, and twice and here you have CH2, CH2, CH, CH3, CH3. So, <clears throat> this is what the R group stands for. So, what you have talked about is there is a chlorophyll A and a chlorophyll B based on that particular position where we talked about where whether it will be CHO or it will be a CH3. Now, we will talk about what distinguishes a chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Let us coming back to the slide. So, this is the second R group what we have talked about. So, there are two zones, one R group I told you out here the top and the other R group out here which I shown in red. Okay. Now, so what you see is the absorption spectra. So, if you if I draw the absorption spectra it will be it will look like something like this. Okay. So, here you have the absorption coefficient which is shown in mole and say around out here 10 to the power 5 and absorption 400, 500. 600 and ending at 700, these are in wavelength in nanometers. Okay. So, 
for chlorophyll A if you look at it, I'll just let me put it in green. So, for the chlorophyll A, the absorption peak is something like this. So, if you see this is what is the chlorophyll A's absorption is going. Okay. Now, if you look at chlorophyll B, which I am so let me just put this. So, this is chlorophyll A, and for chlorophyll B, if you see the absorption, it is something different. So, it will be something like this, it is slightly shifting. Uh, one second, let me put it as chlorophyll B. Okay. So, what you observe is that there is a slight staggering in the wavelength at where chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are absorbing, but what is interesting to note that there are a huge vast part of the spectrum where there are no absorption. These are the peak absorbance which are taking place at that particular wavelength. Now, to summarize this uh, particular slide. It is so. What you, we are observing is that the absorption spectra of chlorophyll A, B, and B are different. So, absorption. These are the take-home message. Absorption spectra of chlorophyll A and B are different. This is the first conclusion you have to draw from this. And uh, secondly, light is not appreciably absorbed by chlorophyll A at 460 nanometer that you can see. At 460 nanometer, light is not appreciably absorbed by chlorophyll A, whereas uh, it is captured by chlorophyll B, which has intense absorption at that wavelength that you can see out here. So, if you see it around 460 nanometer, so, there is a better absorption of chlorophyll chlorophyll B as can, can compared to chlorophyll A and these two kind of chlorophyll complement each other in absorbing incident light. Okay. So, this is the major take home message and the spectral region from 500 to 600 nanometer is only weakly absorbed by these chlorophyll that you can see out here that is what I was trying to tell you in the beginning. So, if you look at this zone there is hardly any kind of ab absorbance which is happening at that region. Okay. But this does not pose a problem for most green plants. Okay. By contrast, light is often limiting factor for cyanobacteria or blue green algae or red algae. They possess accessory. So, for such uh, blue green algae or the red algae, for them there are other accessory molecules which nature has devised, which ensures that they absorb light at those kind of different kind of wavelength. So, having said this, let us summarize this. So, what we have observed is that there are two kind of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and their absorption spectra is slightly staggered, but there is a huge zone between 500 and 600 where there is hardly any kind of ab absorbance which is taking place. But Apart from it, there are several accessory molecules which are available to different species, whether it is a blue green algae, cyanobacteria, red, red algae or whatever. They are supplemented with a series of such different dyes, which absorbs wavelength at different wave, uh, which absorbs light of different wavelength. So, in other words, if you have to kind of imagine it, it is it will be something like this, as if there are different kind of say you know. So, this is the solar energy which is falling on different kind of life forms and they have a different kind of you know so wavelength 1, wavelength 2, wavelength 3, wavelength 4, 5. 
So, nature has equipped most of the life forms with wide array or spectrum of light harvesting pigment by virtue of which it complements the existing panels of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. But this particular aspect is an inspiration for one of the advanced topic what we will be dealing with is called disensitized solar cells. Will be disensitized solar cell. We will talk about this later, but at this stage, just remember there are wide array of such pigments available in nature. So, these are the if I these are the different pigments or natural pigments and dyes available in nature, which otherwise have a role to support the living systems which are there, but those could be an inspiration to develop different kind of another series of solar cells. Okay. We will come later into this. So, this is the overall understanding what I wanted for you people for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, but what is the significance of this chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So, I will close in here. Thank you.